So, um, very happy to be here giving a keynote. Um, thanks, Tim, for inviting me. If I make anything confusing, and I'm very good at doing that, please ask questions. I'd rather not get to the very end of the talk and actually have everyone understand what I've said, then get to the end and leave large gaping holes behind. I'm a technical architect for a division called Core DevOps at Canonical. Um, it really means I'm accountable for the selection of tools, components, software, software design and architecture for a group of about 60 people who spend most of their time creating software and systems. And this gives me a reasonable amount of insight into some of the problems we run into. And, you know, we've got some problems. We spend a bunch of time creating highly tested, highly capable pieces of software and had moderate uptake. So there's something going wrong, and I want to talk a bit about that. My plan, as given to me by Tim, was to drive to Dunedin, talk about testing. Something magical would happen, and, you know, we'd have some profit at the end of it. This is what I'm actually going to talk about. I'm going to talk about project success. It doesn't matter how well your project is tested if it's not a successful project. I mean, really, honestly, I think this is a little bit of an exaggeration. This one, however, I'll stand up and defend all the time. <laughs> Most software sucks. But why? You know, what is it about software that makes it particularly worse than, I don't know, cups, cars, beds, houses. Are we as humans just very bad at making things? There's a lot of theories around. Um, some of the more prominent ones are that we're a new field. We haven't spent a lot of time doing this and we haven't learned how to do it well. But some of the really respected folk around say that that's not it. That it's orders of magnitude more complex than most other things humans try to do. If you look at something like the Space Shuttle, that's hugely complex with almost no software. And it takes a crowd of tens of thousands to put it together and have it work most of the time. And we try and do things around about that complex with teams of 10 or 20 people. And to me, that just gives us an idea of the potential complexity we're dealing with when we build software. But even if this is a good explanation of what's going on, it's not something that gives us a, a handle to grab onto to try and fix things, to do better. And there's got to be a way of doing better. Because there's some incredibly good software written by very small teams that we all use, or most of us will use. Things like GitHub and Gmail are incredible. And they're not built by casts of tens of thousands. Um, and because Tim asked me to talk about testing, I, I kind of have to tie these things together. I think it would be wonderful when building a product if we had a test that failed when we're going in the wrong direction. Not if there's an error in the code, you know, 1 plus 2 instead of 1 plus 1, but if we add a feature that people don't want, <laughs> or we're working on a feature that people actively dislike and would reject our software because of it. So, this is pretty much the amount of signal that would give. You've all used test suites that go green for success, red for failure. Imagine this is a GPS. You're going in the right direction at the right speed at the moment, and you fail to take a corner, so it tells you, no, nope, you've gone the wrong way. This is, to me, about how much guidance we have when we're building software at the moment. We spend a whole bunch of time doing design, and then we go off and write code for weeks and weeks and weeks, and we get about this much information back. What we want is an actual map. We want some way of predicting where we should go and figuring out early when there's problems. Um, this analogy, I, I was inspired by a guy called Rich Hickey, who's the author of Closure, and he's given some really, really good talks. And one of the talks he did recently is a thing called Simple Made Easy. It's on QCon if you want to look it up. Just Simple Made Easy. And in that talk, he refers to programming by bouncing off the guide rails. The idea that if you've got a whole comprehensive unit test suite, functional test suite, integration test suite, and you can make an arbitrary change to your program, and a test will fail if it's wrong. Again, think about the amount of signal you get. Compared to a GPS, 
that's almost useless. It, yes, it tells you there's something wrong with all the previous decisions you've made, but it doesn't actually take you where you want to go. And none of the tools we've got take us where we want to go. Um, I've written a raft of unit test related tools, things like Nose and Pi.test. They also offer very good guidance about these are the things that are wrong, but nothing about where you need to go. In short, software tests and most similar tests are poor predictors of user behavior and adoption of a product, whether people enjoy it, whether it solves a need for them, are the things that you want to be able to predict. Imagine you have a website and you want to test how it performs in the real world. You want to throw a whole bunch of users at it and see how it goes. So you write a configuration script for one of the existing load testing tools out there, you throw it at your website on you know, some EC2 servers and you observe how it goes, you say, hey, wow, that's great. We're really, really happy with it. Every small difference you've got is going to make that test less likely to be a good predictor of how, what will actually happen when you deploy that software in the field. And I've got a lovely anecdote here. We have in launch, who here has used or heard of launchpad.net? Great, okay. Um, so there's about half you haven't, which means I need to do a little segue and say launchpad.net is a code development site like SourceForge or GitHub. It hosts code and it hosts bug trackers. Um, unique amongst the sort of generic code hosting sites, it hosts the code for Ubuntu, for the distribution. So it understands the structure of a Linux distribution, which things like SourceForge and GitHub don't. You can kind of map stuff into it, but that's its unique selling point. Ubuntu gets a lot of non-technical users reporting bugs. They come up, they say, hey, there's something wrong, and they file a bug. And the development community, the technical community goes, hey, this sucks, because these guys don't have a clue. They have no idea what they're talking about. So a while ago, a system was built to do full text search that would find the most likely duplicate bug and really encourage people to say, hey, this is my bug, I don't need to file a new bug, I don't need to get mail forever from people discussing this problem. And it worked really, really well. It's kind of expensive to execute. It worked so well that the existing full text search was abandoned by a large proportion of the technical users. They went and started filing new bugs to get into this wizard that would help them find duplicates, even though they were people working on Ubuntu who knew everything about it already. We didn't predict that. And because it was a more expensive search, because it was doing a lot of stuff in the back end, our system load, instead of going you know, slowly up as people did more and more things, went up like that. <laughs> and two years ago, we were getting huge numbers of complaints. Performance is terrible, it sucks, I can't find anything. And we'd go and look at the full text search and we'd say, hey, it's fine. Until we found out that actually they were using this other entry point. That was it meant to be for maybe 20 or 30 people a day. It was having thousands and thousands of hits a day. So you can't predict what people are going to do very well. I mean, maybe psychologists can, but... <laughs> um, so, we've got some problems with success, but there are these successful projects out there. And if you look in the PyPy, there's lots and lots and lots of small projects, single author projects. So, folk manage to be successful. What are they doing that's different? Or what is it about those projects that makes them successful? Is it something we can learn from and replicate on larger projects? What is it about the projects that aren't successful but they have good technical underpinnings, have chosen good technologies, are able to iterate quickly, have good test suites, low errors in terms of the software, but still not hugely successful? And I think design is the answer. Now, this may sound like an odd answer. Single, small project, single person building on it, Where's the designer? Where's the design thinking that's going on? I'm going to come back to that. Um, one of the key things, though, is to note that design is a hugely broad term, and it's overused in some sense, but also accurately used. And the big thing for me is it's, it's a forward-looking thing. You're pointing out, you're describing, you're contriving, you're coming up with. It's not looking at what you've got, which is what our other tools that we have available to us do. And the sorts of levels you can look at with design are interaction design, visual design, architecture, 
code design, even style guides kind of fit in that spectrum. Who here has heard of Lean Startup? Okay, and Lean in general? Right, okay. So, actually, let me ask a completely different question. Who here is a student? Great. Um, who works for their job on source code, writing software? Cool, all right. I'll take a small segue. So, the Toyota manufacturing system uh, is a system that's used by Toyota to build cars, and that has absolutely nothing to do with software. But a bunch of people thought it was a very interesting way of learning about what goes wrong when you're building something and ga gathering feedback from everyone involved in the process rather than just, you know, some guy at the top looking down and saying, hey, that car came out bad. And they copied this, and they adapted it for... Uh, other sorts of organizations than manufacturing organizations, and it's come out and been called Lean, the Lean um, system. And that's made its way into the software world, and it's a strong, it's got a lot of connection to the Agile movement. Lean thinking and Agile thinking have a lot in common with each other, although they start with different tools to do their analysis about what goes wrong in the process of building things. Lean is completely useless at predicting product success, though. It's, again, not aimed at that. Lean Startup, which is um, a term coined by Eric Ries, and he's literally written the book on it, is a variation of that thinking applied to the problems of building a successful business. And to build a successful business, you need to build a successful product. Now, that matters to me, even though I'm not building for-fee products, because if I'm going to spend a large chunk of my life working with other people building something, even if it's open source, I want it to be successful. I want people to want it and to use it. He's on to something, and a lot of this talk kind of hopefully dovetails with that, but since you guys aren't broadly familiar with that, that won't help you. <laughs> the key thing, the key insight that Lean Startup has is that whether you are being successful or not in terms of meeting someone's needs is something that can be tested. You can measure it. It won't tell you what direction you need to go in. You need to do design to do that. But it will tell you if the th direction you thought you needed to go in is actually effective. It doesn't help you if you're in a, a local minima, where any sorry, a local maxima, where any change makes things temporarily worse. So you still need to use your noggin and be willing to take a big jump every now and then. But it does help you really tune the, the direction you're going in. In terms of successful projects, uh, there's a, a group called the Standish Group that does a report. In 1994, they quoted 16% of corporate projects. Anyone want to take a guess? 16% of corporate software projects were successful or unsuccessful or somewhere in the middle? Yeah, 16% successful. And that's kind of a terrifying number. Right? If you've got eight teams in an organisation, and the team leaders look around at each other and go, you know, one of you is going to come in on time, on budget, doing what people want. Not great. Things have got better. In 2004, and I'm, you know, in two more years we should get another decade-wide data point, but in 2004 it was 34% successful. So it got significantly better. But they define success purely as on time, on budget. And that's not terribly interesting to me because of been in situations where we've implemented a system on time, on budget, and then had no one in the organisation use it, or effectively no one use it. So I think we need a better definition of success. But just to touch a little bit more on the statistics, 51% in this 2004 chaos report, 51% were challenged, which means that they weren't cancelled, but they weren't on time, they weren't on budget. And they kind of tended to blow out really badly hundreds of millions of dollars blow out. If you're going to blow out, blow out the full size or a multiple of the full size of your original time estimate or your budget estimate. 15% um, cancelled completely, which again is improved from the, the um, 10 years before that. So if we want a better definition of success, what should it be? What makes a project successful? How would you define a successful project? 
And if 34% nowadays are successful by on time on budget, maybe 34% are successful in other metrics. And why? Particularly these small projects. I want to come back to that, you know? Just think about when you're building something yourself for yourself, are you more likely to be successful than one time in three? Yeah. Oh, right. So my intuition says that when I build something for me, I'm much more likely to be successful to keep using it and to have some other people probably pick it up and use it than one time in three. One time in three, I'd probably stop writing software. <clears throat> so this is the key thing for me. Meet the needs of your users at a price they're happy to pay. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean dollars. Well, I mean, open source, time investment, maybe it's a horrible UI, and every time they use it, they feel like they're being punched in the face, but it does something completely invaluable that they can't get elsewhere. Of course, if you take that approach, as soon as someone does what they need without punching them in the face, you're gone. <coughs> TLA. <coughs> But needs are funny things, right? I need my car to get me into to work every day, but I also need it to actually be a smooth ride. I want to feel happy when I get out of it at the end of the trip. Uh, word processors need to let you edit text, but they don't want you, you don't want to be feeling like you're squinting and going blind at the end of the day. There's a, a great book by a guy called Alan Cooper who runs a design consulting company in the US called About Face. Now, I don't agree with a whole bunch of things in this book, but I'll let you make your own decisions about those things. It's worth reading because it's got a huge amount of information about how to understand what users are looking for. And one thing in particular is that they are looking to feel good about the product. They want to come away feeling happy with themselves. If they end up feeling stupid or frustrated, you're not meeting an emotional need, even though you're analysing software. So you can't analyse your UI and, and your overall experience in terms of lines of code or you know, the number of colours or icons on the screen. It's got to be a bit more precise than that. Specifically, users want to use your product, but to build a successful product, what else do they need to do? They need to help us understand the things they're looking for, what needs they've got. So we've got to go out and talk to our users. But it's more than just users. Someone's sponsoring the project. If we're doing it ourselves, we're putting our time and effort into it. If we're doing it for an organisation internally, someone has said it's worth diverting revenue to doing this thing. If you're doing it to build an external product, you've essentially got investors who are looking to get a return on the investment at some point. Sometimes sponsors are altruistic, but my experience is that that's few and far between, even in the open source space. Hello? Right. Um, Developers also have needs that have to be met as part of this process. We need to be able to feel reasonably happy. If we're looking at a pile of spaghetti code, we're not going to be happy. We're not going to spend our extra evenings hacking on this thing. I mean, maybe if we get an emotional connection to it, we will try and fix that and take it as a challenge. But what we really want is something that's maintainable, it's a pleasure to work on, and that we feel happy when someone comes to us and says, hey, we've just realised the users need this other thing, and we can take that on as a something to step up to rather than something to whimper and cower away from. Designers have needs as well. Again, they have the, the kind of emotional project related needs I've touched on with the, the other two, but they also need time to speak to users. They need to understand what it is. So, and, and this is at all levels, code design, UI design, interaction design, whatever. Whoever the designer is, whatever they're designing, they need to understand the implementation side of it. Not enough to do it, but enough not to make mistakes. Um, who here has worked with a, a designer on software? All right. Now, leave your hands up. Who here has had that designer ask you to do something completely insane? <laughs> right. And it's not because they aren't able to understand the technical stuff. It's because they haven't got enough context to understand what they are actually asking for. So, Lean says if you separate responsibility, accountability and capability, you'll have terrible problems. And so, with a designer, you're separating out the capability, they can't implement, but you're not separating out their responsibility and accountability. So it gets into exactly that sort of problem. 
And finally, if you're building a web service or you're building something that's going to be deployed in a corporation by you know, a centralized system administrator or whatever, you've got operators. Um, and this and is not a meaning term. It's just these aren't the people who want to use the software to achieve their job. These are the people who need to work with the software to help other people achieve their job. And they also need, you know, they need documentation, they need ability to drive the product configuration to do what they need to do, they need to be able to scale it out, whatever. Yeah. This is a diagram from Fred Brooks, The Mythical Man Month. And in it he postulates that when you take a regular program and you turn it into a product, it becomes three times as expensive to build. You have to write documentation, you have to deal with more corner cases, you have to package it up, you have to ship it, you have to help people do that, all of these overheads. If you take a, just a regular program and you start working in a system space, so instead of just purely you know, uh, user space, you start working in, in, in at a more detailed level, particularly you end up building something other people can build on. So I would generally these days call it a library rather than a system. So I would read this as program, library, product, library, product. Taking your program and libraryizing it three times. And these figures, they kind of fit with my experience. So making something into a library is significantly harder than just doing it in the first place. You get benefits. It's often worth doing it. But you pay these overheads. And if you do both things, if you create a library that other people want to use and it's a product you want them to consume, it's, it's nearly ten times as hard to do the thing, assuming you're doing it at all well. And this is hugely on the technical side. So if we consider what happens when we build software ourselves, everything overlaps. We're building it for ourselves, we're doing the design ourselves, we have a complete comprehensive context over everything. There's no communication friction between the designer. I'll never ask myself to do something completely insane. I know how much time and effort I'm willing to put into it, and I can fairly accurately judge how long it's going to take me before I start, because the design is relatively complete, because it's all coming from in here, even though I need to learn some stuff as I go. So my observation is that when you build something yourself with a very, very, very small team, it's dramatically easier to build the same thing as when a bigger team takes it on. And the question you have to ask is, you've got these specialised skills, making money, um, doing whatever the, the, the thing is, is made for, data entry, whatever, um, building the product, the actual implementation, doing the design. The more specialised you are, the better you are at doing these things. What, why, why doesn't that pay off? Why doesn't it actually get easier when you get a, a bigger product? So this is my variation on, on, on Fred's diagram. When you scratch your own itch, it's dead easy. If you bring in a separate designer or a separate sponsor who's going to pay for it or a separate user that you're building for, so each one of those things, I think it roughly doubles the time and effort it will take to build the thing. Partly because you've got two people involved. You've got to communicate between them. But also because you will fail to communicate. Communication is hard. There will be things that, uh, if you have a separate designer, there will be things about how we can implement that you will fail to mention because it's just part and parcel of our knowledge about how Python works or whatever language we're working in. Designer won't know that. They will then come up with an idea and you'll say, well, actually, we can't do that. And you're going to have to go back and forth in the education process. It's a huge amount of waste. Why should it matter so much? You know? I think we have to go back to basics to answer that question. This diagram, I'm just curious, do, do they currently show this diagram in computer engineering courses? Yeah, a couple of nods, a couple of head shakes. It's all good, all right? <laughs> so, and I found this out recently. This is the earliest troll I know of in computer science. <laughs> the guy that put this together, a guy called Royce, in the paper he presented this, he said, this is a flawed model, don't use it. <laughs> he, he's, now, I don't know where the pointer is, but he, he said you should point arrows going back up. 
So from maintenance back to verification, verification, implementation, implementation, design, design to requirements, so that you could provide feedback when you got things wrong. And everyone ignored this, and there were papers built on this that completely ignored it. It set us back by years. Um, actually, I'll go back for a second. So if you, if you look at this, pay, pay attention. There is complete separation here. The idea that you can finish your requirements and then start your design. And I can pretty much guarantee that anyone who has built something with or for someone else has always had the experience where they have got the design down and they've started working and the person has come along and said, Look, what you've designed is wonderful and it does exactly what I told you I needed, but I was wrong. I missed something. And I can only tell that I missed something now that I have seen your design. And the interesting thing is this happens when we do it on our own for our own small project, but we don't consciously separate out the steps so we don't see it as clearly. <coughs> This is the spiral model. Bohm put this together. It's not a troll. But it's also not great. Because it's got a lot of latency between each step. I don't know if you can read the text, but the um, bottom left hand, bottom right hand corner is saying detailed design, code, integration, test, implementation, and then you know back round and round and round and round and round. In um, the design of design, Fred Brooks proposes that this is the closest thing he's seen to a good model for how we design and build software. Uh, and this is from a group of guys, Mala, Poon, and Bullinger, and it's called the co-evolution model. And the idea is that you bounce back and forth between defining your problem and solving it. Define, solve, define, solve, design, solve. A much tighter loop. So more time spent designing, more time uh, building, and less time doing stuff that's kind of incidental and beside the key focus of what you're trying to achieve. After all, testing doesn't give us guidance. Testing tells us whether we've achieved what we said we were going to achieve. It doesn't tell us if that is the right thing. So my model of what I do when I sit down and write code is that I kind of sit in an inner loop. I spend most of my day doing development, and you know, I go around and I write a test, I do some code, I refactor, test code, refactor, test code, refactor. It's in a loop. And if you look at profiling for, for programs, generally, inner loops take up 80 or 90% of the runtime of a program. You spend most of your time in the inner loop, and a very small amount of time in your outer loop. So how did our inner loop as a community evolve? Well, you know, back in the waterfall days, we had code teams and test teams, and they were completely separate. So imagine how long it takes you to find out that you introduced an, a bug into your program. You hand it off to someone else, they come back to you a week later, they file a defect. By then, you are a week further on, and this is coming back into your work queue, so you don't switch context and fix it immediately. The amount of sort of open defects that sit in this model is huge. It, like, it's terrifying. So we came up, you know, TDD, very early bits of the Agile movement, where you'd write some tests and you'd write some code and you'd flip back between them. And this worked a lot better, but it produces horrendous spaghetti code. It produces this code because at no point are we actually stopping to reflect on the design of the code at the design level. Um, and this is where the thing called refactoring came in. So the idea is that any time you realise your design is starting to creak, you stop and you fix it. And you're not adding features, you're just making the thing itself better. You may make it easier to add features afterwards. And the reason I've got arrows in all directions here is because you could write some code making a test pass and realise things have got ugly. Or you might be writing a new test and realise, well, look, <laughs> I can't actually write a test for the thing I want to write because the design of the structure of the code I'm dealing with is such that the test is going to be awful and that's the signal you should take the time to go and fix the code to do the refactoring. I generally expect people to spend about equal amount of times on these three things and they're in a loop. If you spend you know, a small amount of time testing, you'll probably not have enough test coverage. If you spend a small amount of time refactoring, you will end up with spaghetti and I'll happily take a bet with that on anyone in any language. And if you spend a small amount of time coding, you're not going to 
get through the tasks you're trying to achieve particularly quickly. So like most profiling things, I think as soon as you frame it in a particular way and measure it, you end up doing roughly one-to-one-to-one -one ratios. But the key thing for me is the amount of time you spend doing something defines the amount of time you spend on something overall. So if we want to make sure we spend a bunch of time doing design of our code, we have to spend a bunch of time doing design of our code, which is what refactoring is all about. But design of our code doesn't speak to product success, not, not terribly well. So if we come back to this diagram, we get stuck. We do problem statement, we go down to prototype one, and we stay there. We've got no escape valve, no position where we go back and say, hey, it's time to do more design. And this matters, because your abstractions leak. I, I can think of maybe two or three times in my professional career where I've written some code and it had no impact on the end user experience. It's, it's subtle, there are many times where the abstractions leak just a little and nobody really cares, but there are many more times where it leaks and it turns out to have leaked a huge amount and <laughs> you regret it hugely. Um, okay, so let's say you need to store some numbers in a, a, an embedded system. You've got no database available, so you decide to write your own little mini database. And you make it capable of storing numbers up to, um, I don't know, 500,000 or something. Because that's bigger than anything that's been specified so far. That's an abstraction layer, right? You see, okay, there's a storage layer that can store up to 100,000. Um, five months later, somebody is going to file a bug saying, so I put your little embedded device tracking my um, automated um, uh, production floor machines, and it crashed and the factory seized up when we went past 100,000 units shipped in that month. As an example. So, I mean, it, that's kind of an extreme sort of scenario. A much more common thing is that you get an input widget or something and you decide to refactor the code to be reused amongst two or three other widgets. And at the time you did that, you met the constraints, the design constraints you had on the look and feel for everything, but someone comes along and adds another widget and they reuse your abstraction and their widget ends up looking and behaving like the other widgets you had, which is a good thing, except that they had different design constraints. And unless they consciously say, hey, does that abstraction really match everything I have, they inherit that behaviour, um, that, that kind of thing. But the, the general rule for me is any time someone says, okay, we've got some code that does exactly what it needs to do, let's turn it into an abstraction, I go, okay, well, when you do that, be aware, that's going to show up everywhere that it gets reused. And that can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. And the bad side of it from a design point of view is it's designed by default. At that point, when you reuse that abstraction, you're no longer designing what it's going to look like. You are inheriting. And to the degree that you want consistency, that's a really good thing. But consistency is one attribute of a, a good design. So my basic point here is you need to apply design thinking every time you create or use or, or change code because it's going to interact with the design in some way. And you need to spend an appropriate amount of time. Something that doesn't interact with your design much, spend a very small amount of time thinking about design. Something that interacts with your design a lot, spend a lot of time thinking about it. And the big problem, the one I don't have any sort of answer for, is how to tell in advance how much time that will be. Here's actually a really um, good example of the reverse. This is a design choice that had huge impact on the code. So this is a screenshot of part of a, a Launchpad bug report. The status number title um, lozenges are the visible columns of data. It's not really column, but the visible bits of data that are in, in the report. The tags list is a list of the tags that each bug has. Now, previously we had a really tabular format, and you could click... Uh, you define sort by a drop-down that was a separate widget. But people kept saying, can we click on the columns? Can we click on the columns? Can we click on the columns? So our designer, and, and 
I'm not criticizing the design, just this is talking about the consequences of things. The designer said, okay, so we can get rid of that widget if we say these are the things you're going to show in the table and each thing can be clicked on to do a sort. So tags is something that there is no well-defined sort for. If you imagine two bugs, one that's got uh, you know, the booby trap tag and the oops tag, and another one that's got the um, mochu tag and the oops tag, from a, a user perspective, which one of those should come first? The one that's got booby trap? To be able to make use of information sorted in that order, you're going to have to know a lot about the structure of which bugs have which tags. I mean, finding all the bugs with a particular tag is useful, but sorting a large collection by this arbitrary number of, of enumerated values is questionable. And that sort doesn't work on any of our larger bug collections because it does some horrible, horrible, horrible stuff to the back-end database and it takes about 30 seconds to figure out the, um, the collection because we defined an arbitrary sort order that the computer could do sometimes. So this is an example of the, of the interaction between design and implementation and my point about abstractions is it goes both ways. The abstractions around tags were defined to meet the previous design criteria. The design criteria change, the abstractions have to change. It's a, it's a two-way street. This is the outer loop many agile folk have. Um, two weeks, sometimes six weeks long is called an iteration. You do some design at the beginning of it, you talk to the customer, you figure out what's going on. If you're lucky, you have the customer stay with you the whole time. But then you go and build, and you sit on build, doing your inner loop, doing your inner loop, doing your inner loop, and then you deliver it, and then you go back to design. And this kind of, you know, it's a bit problematic. I think this is a much better outer loop, where you say, we'll flip back to design every time we realize that what we're doing is a bit formless or unclear whether it's going to really deliver success. And we want to, it's not covered here, but the, as I said, the Lean Startup guys, test your designs, test whether they're working. That means you need to be able to iterate much more rapidly between these two phases. You can't hand off and then do a bunch of work. Um, and so the key thing there is to be able to go to design mode any time you're not sure whether what you're working on delivers the, what the user needs. Um, and two weeks is an incredibly long time for, in terms of product evolution. Just think how much code you can write in two weeks and how much waste there can be if that doesn't actually match with user needs. So what should the ratios be in, in that outer loop? You know, should they still be the one to one to one kind of thing. There's a very empirical way you can tell whether you're doing enough testing. And I get new engineers asking me this all the time. Should, do I really need to write another test? How much testing should I be doing on this branch? And the answer is that if your code fails, you need to test more. Very simple. You know, you can learn as you go. Um, I don't think anyone's actually got good studies about how much testing is optimal. There are studies on the benefits of lots of tests and whether TDD works or, or doesn't, and the answer is the jury's out on it. Lots of tests is great, but TDD is kind of a, an unanswered question. The problem is, again, though, that tests aren't directional. They don't tell us where we need to go. If your product fails, though, design can help you with that. Um, I should put the obvious caveat there. If your product fails because it's crap, i.e. you've got quality problems, you're not shipping on time, the thing is a gig to download and all it does is a calendar. You know, there's lots of things that can be wrong without it actually being a design flaw. Um, now, I have to put a caveat here. I hate doing this. We haven't tested all of these solutions. These are things that we have sort of scheduled as things we'd like to experiment more, more with in CDO, and, and we are starting to experiment with them. One of them is to design daily, rather than 
doing some design, handing it off to developers. The developers work on it and they hand back the result. Do design every day. Just enough design. Don't do more design than developers can actually make progress on each day. You need to test the output every time it comes back, not a week later the next blessed build, or two weeks, or six weeks. The very next build needs to be thrown out and tested against real candidate users. So if you've got a website, uh, do A-B testing. You know, Every day, get at least two or three different experiments up and see whether people's behaviour changes. If you've got a, a, a product that runs on people's machine, set up a channel where you can push that build out every day do appropriate delivery and QA steps. Continuous integration is an essential part and continuous delivery with automated validation of you know, every known problem you've got. Get it out onto receptive people's laptops every day. Get feedback from them every day. Instrument it. Tell them, say, look, we want to make sure this product is one that you really like. We kind of expect that you're going to use it every, every day or two. We'd like to get anonymous stats back about whether you used it or not and how long you used it for because we think this will tell us whether we're heading in the right direction or not, without you having to come and tell us exactly what you think every day. You can do that as well, but we'd like... Yeah. And if 5% of your audience sign in for that, you'll get good signal. It won't be perfect, but it will be there. Um, and if you have something in between, something that is uh, neither runs on the laptop nor a website, then come and talk to me later. I'd like to hear about that. The second thing is that design, this is something that is, it's really fascinating me at the moment, design has a bunch of science in it. It turns out that folk have figured out how we react to things on the screen, how many things we can remember at once, um, how many steps we're willing to go through before something starts to frustrate us. So there's a whole bunch of science behind the constraints for the design. And there's similar sets of constraints for how many things we as programmers can remember, how many abstractions we can hold in our heads at once. So design at all levels has a bunch of science behind it. Now I'm not suggesting folk who are programmers become designers, but if you know some of the science of design, you can foresee the answers to questions like, I need to add another parameter here for configuration because this other thing that we're trying to do requires configuration and it's going to change this form over there. Is that going to be okay or not? Something which when I was just uh, you know, completely focused on programming, I would say, oh, I don't want to talk to a designer about that. They won't care, it's just one more widget on that form. And it turns out that when a designer says, you know, only put five widgets on the form, it's not because they think five's a magic number, it's because they're looking at the number of things people can sort of perceive directly without having to study, and this is a key form that everyone sees when they sign up to the product. So if you make that form worse, many people won't sign up and you'll lose 10% you know, of your users. It's like, okay, <laughs> that's interesting. So you know, get out there, get, get some data on it. Doesn't mean you become a designer, but it means you start to appreciate the value they actually bring. Um, another thing you can do, and this one is it's a bit more sort of formal, but map what you're doing back to your problem space. Think of it this way. If you're building something, and it's not making your product better, if it's not actually part of what users want in any of those sort of different sorts of needs, including the people who are going to operate and the people who are going to sell it, if it's not serving one of those needs, why the hell are you doing it? Right? You can spend a whole bunch of time doing stuff that's really technically interesting but doesn't move your product forward at all. Having an actual track back, uh, like... Uh, if you use Doxygen or PyDoc or whatever, you could, in every method or class, just link this back to the thing, to the requirement you've got for why you're doing this. And then if that requirement goes away, you can search for it and then actively go and remove dead code. Even though it's still used, you'll be able to tell it's not needed anymore. We can rip that whole thing out, make the code base smaller, easier to maintain, easier to clean up. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to have nicer graphics for this. <laughs> I'm not a graphic designer. <laughs> if we put design in our inner loop, even the kind of primitive design that I'm capable of, uh, I'm sure you guys will do much better, but if we put it in the inner loop to even 
a small degree, if we add an escape valve that says, I think this is time to do design, and not design of the code, which is what refactoring is, but design of the product, as long as you've got the capability to do that just in time, like not an hour later, but immediately, which is probably tricky to arrange, but if you can do it, I think that would be a fantastic way to get more design happening. And the interesting thing to me is if you've learned some design skills, maybe you can do that yourselves. And if you haven't, maybe you have a, te uh, a tame designer who's working with you on the project and you can pick up the phone, walk around to the desk, hop on RC, whatever, and say, hey, we need to tweak something. This is happening. But the key thing is to have it in your head when you start to see warning signs, the same way you see warning signs, code smells for refactoring, I think there are design smells that we need to start noticing. Um, open area for research is to figure out what they are. You know, probably ask a designer about that. Um, now this is kind of specific to large organisations. Don't share your designers. Um, being able to do more design depends on being able to bring it in in a fairly low latency fashion. If you've got a a team that's doing queued work and doing some design work for your team, some design work for another team, you're going to have a, a large context switch cost every time you try to go back into the design phase. So um, particularly with small projects, it may be expensive, but make sure you've actually got <coughs> dedicated on-tap designers. It's better to have a designer idle and available when you need it than to have them fully utilised and unable to support you when you need it, if you want to keep momentum up on your product. Momentum's the wrong word because things don't keep getting developed when we stop actively working on them, but it feels like momentum. So, um, Likewise, don't share ops. If you've got a website and you've got a, a large ops team, make sure there's at least a couple of folk, even if they are able to go and do other things, who will drop it and come and work with you when you've got a problem because otherwise your queuing is going to, to blow out extremely quickly. Um, there's nothing wrong with having teams that offer design within an organisation and teams that offer ops within an organisation. The, the problem is the context switching cost. You've got to keep that really, really low. How are we going for time? Ten minutes. Well, so I have some bonus content. <laughs> but first, are there any questions? Um, has this been entertaining, provocative, boring? Thought provoking. Um, are, you ta are you trying to make your question heard or? No? Oh, okay. So to, to see if I understood the question, in, in 96 there was a huge amount of um, latency involved in getting going with projects. Hmm? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And has that got better? Right, is our infrastructure better and it makes everything, yeah. Yeah. So I think team structure is probably more of a factor than computing power. Um, the programs we were trying to write in 1996 are smaller in concept than the programs we're trying to write today, um, except for research groups doing voice recognition and artificial intelligence, and I you know, welcome our new AI overlords. <laughs> the, the team structure stuff, though, has evolved a lot. We um, kind of railway top-down hierarchical management it was everything in '96, and now there are organisations with hundreds or thousands of people doing much more relaxed styles and being much more um, focused on supporting goal. You know, here's your broad objective: go and do it, rather than itty nitty bitty. I want you to do this today and this today and this today. Um, 
but I think there's still a wide range of organisations out there, and you could probably um, throw a few darts and get every answer under the sun just in this room alone. One of the things I think has made a big difference is the process models that we've got, right? The waterfall model, when I went through uni, that was do, do a project with the waterfall model. I think every single one in our computer science class failed their project because they used the waterfall model. <laughs> like all, all the teams, they, they, they all got you know, part way through implementation because they, they had this model with a very high startup cost. Come up with requirements, do a design, then start coding. So the latency is, was self imposed. I mean, if you'd said, right, we know it's going to be a website, guys start putting together a website, the designers start talking to users, you could have at least had a site with no content, <laughs> but all the basic infrastructure together by the time the first conceptual design started to flow out. We've also got lots of libraries around now that we didn't have. Um, you can, I can think of what, at least half a dozen ways I can bring up a web server showing a directory with what's installed on my laptop. You know, Twisted's got one built in, standard library for Python's got one built in, there's Apache, obviously. Uh, I think someone's written a web server in Bash. There's, there's, we, we start at a higher level in, in, in the project for what we're trying to build. Um, at least from my experience, most of the stuff I've done in the last uh, six or seven years has had existing teams. So I haven't had the experience of setting up a new team from scratch for quite a while. Uh, so I'm not really in a position to, to, to look at that aspect of it. Um, but I can imagine teething problems as you get the team working together, figure out who's better at what sort of stuff. So that people, so there's an interesting, um, who's heard of Dunbar's number? Wow, okay, you guys need to look up Dunbar's number. Really, really cool number. Um, the idea is that there is a, a fairly fixed, a um, fixed by the plumbing in here number of people that we can model as, as humans. So it's a, somewhere between 150 and 200, and if you work in an organisation that's under that size, after a bit of time, you will know everyone there. You, you might not know them intimately, but you'll know them well enough that whenever something goes wrong that they can help with, you'll go directly to them. So a lot of organisational documentation doesn't need to exist, and it probably won't exist in that small an organisation because people won't have problems tackling the stuff, um, whether it's finding the, the maintenance guy or finding the person that's really, really good at SQL, it will be automatic. But beyond that size, you won't be able to hold that information in the back of your head. It won't be available when you need it, and you'll have to have a directory service, um, explicit process, explicit procedures to make sure you don't stand on people's toes, that you ask the right people the right questions, and so on. So um, I think that's an interesting kind of thing to tie into the effectiveness of large teams. Clay Shirky in one of his TED Talks talks about um, massively online collaboration and different kinds of projects, and Wikipedia is one example, but open source software is another he looks at. And he says that there's a, a sort of a, almost a tan curve where um, a small number of people write most of the project, and a massive number of people each maybe just write one patch or one contribution. And he says that the total amount of um, Product improvement that can be created is actually being contributed by those people who only put small amounts in, but their work would be useless and impossible if it wasn't for that core team doing their work. Can you, is that sort of what you're talking about? Um, it's an interesting observation. I haven't done any analysis of that myself. I did look up some statistics as part of the preparing this talk on Olo for the active projects, which projects are still getting patches in a, you know, the last year or so, 50% of them have one committer. So when you talk about a large number of small projects, that's kind of like half of everything is one committer. And I didn't really dig into what, what happens beyond that. Um, certainly, I, I, I think it's a very well-recognised pattern that lots of projects have a core team and uh, additional people come on and do stuff. The thing that's interesting to me is how you maintain integrity of design, integrity of code, in that sort of structure. 
um, if you have a very small team who know everything well, they can put significant cultural pressure on patches coming in to get them to, to align. And you see that happen in the Linux kernel and Mozilla and, and lots of other places. But the problem is how you, how you make it worthwhile to the contributors to fit in with these designs, like code design and, and UI, the whole stack, when what they want to achieve is, is kind of independent of that consistency and, 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 and so on. So I think you have to be willing to say no to patches. You have to say, look, you know, it's actually going to impact us significantly in the long term if we take this as it is, and I don't have the time to, to make it not have that effect. But I can tell you what you need to do. Very, I think very, very few projects get over 150 um, folk in the community at any one time. Like, def I'll define in the community as actively engaged in contributing code. So you'll, you'll get large communities where there's many, many people that use it and talk to each other about it. And even then, I think you'll find that the core group of that, if you were to measure it, is very, very rarely going to exceed 200 people. And I, th I think that's Dunbar's number at work in a kind of subtle fashion. Um. Hmm? We're out of time. Well, there we go. Thank you.